nation's favourite antiques experts. Let's get fancy. Behind the wheel of a classic car. I'm always in turbo. And a go. Scar Britain for antiques. Hot stuff. The aim to make the biggest profit at auction. <gasps> but it's no mean feat. There'll be worthy winners. Cha ching. Oh my goodness. And valiant losers. Mm, bonkers. Will it be the high road to glory? You are my ray of sunshine. Oh, stop it. Or the slow road to disaster. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> This is Antiques Road Trip. Yeah. Today we embark on a brand new adventure, making fascinating discoveries right from the get-go. I've only ever seen you with a hat on. Are you curious to see what's under there? No, what's oh, oh, beautiful head of hair. Oh. Look at that. Yes, that's famously behatted Ochuko <laughs> Ojuri at the wheel alongside wing woman Margie Cooper. Are you feeling quite competitive on this? Look, who doesn't want to win? I just want to have no, fun. I won't lose any sleep if I lose. Well, that's that sorted out. And plus, there's the delightful motor they'll be sallying forth in, of course. That's a Jaguar car. I feel very sophisticated in this. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Quite easy to get out of. <laughs> Good point. The 1962 Mark II Jag is better than most when it comes to ingress and egress. Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> also manufactured before seat belts were mandatory, so do drive safely. Margie from Cheshire is a dealer with a clear-eyed approach to succeeding at this malarkey. If it's cheap, I'm going to buy you. While Londoner Chuko is also a dealer. Too cool for school. Look at this. Oh. He has a rather more romantic approach. I want to find some good bits and pieces and they reward me for believing in them. Yeah. The worst thing is, is when they don't reward you, when you've believed I know, it. you feel heartbroken. <laughs> yes, that has been known to happen. Their route begins in Liverpool and then heads south, staying close to the Welsh border to arrive in the West Country before a climactic finale in Didcot. But first, the quality of Mersey. Ah, oh, they're great people in Liverpool. Yeah, so friendly. <laughs> great senses of humour. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Super Scouse Scoutabout starts out close to the centre of the city. Famous for a certain pop group, of course. Well, quite a lot of groups, actually, including the fabulous Echo and the Bunny Men. And here come our bright-eyed and bushy-tailed experts. Whoa, whoa! Looks like they found themselves a nice warm parking spot. And inside the Liverpool Antique Centre... So much to see, so much to see. Not to mention so little time. £200 each, of course. I wonder who that once belonged to. And Steve's the man to parlay with. Whenever they do find anything. So instantly recognisable, this. I quite like this stuff. It used to be very collectible. It's called Dickensian ware. And it's very distinctive because it's all depicting scenes and the people who were in the novels. So it says Saracens. I think that's a pub that was featured in Nicholas Nickleby. And it began in about 1912 to commemorate the centenary of Charles Dickens' birthday. On the 7th of February in Portsmouth. I used to collect the plates years ago. It's got a bit of damage there and it's got that mark on it which tells you it's Dickensian wear. But it's hugely popular and I don't really want to buy it, but it's so distinctive. And it's quite nice trying to guess which novel it is. Sort of, what the Dickens? <laughs> you comfy. Hello there. You know who you look like? Who? Gulliver. <laughs> <laughs> In Lilliput. I know, I was sick of being big all the time, so I thought, you know, look at this. Why are your feet on the floor? <laughs> <laughs> See you later. Take care. Bye. <laughs> There's a lot of talk and very little action at the moment. Come on! So we got around here. What have we got in here? Wow! <laughs> An anatomical aid for students to learn how to deal with their patients with all the bits and pieces. Do the blood pressure. <laughs> Wobbly fingers. Manufactured by Adam Rui and Co of London. Yeah. I wonder if that's got a chance. No ticket price. It's a bit different, isn't it? If it's the right money, I'll have a go at it. Talk about going out on a limb. <laughs> Steve. Hi, Marjorie. <laughs> I've seen a bit of a silly buy. So it's the right money, I'll buy it. It's the case with the arm in it. Give us 40 quid for it. Done. What are you doing there? 
I've what got this, t- like, nice pinch back. Yeah? Morning brooch. Aye, aye. Do we have another deal in prospect all of a sudden? Oh, that's quite nice. You don't see much pinchback. No. Poor man's gold. So well, how much is that? It can be 25 quid. So for the two? 65, 15, <laughs> 25. Makes sense. OK, you're done. Margie, hands over the cash. Steve, thank you very much. Now, do tell us a bit more about that brooch. I think this is quite nice. It's Victorian. And Pinchback, it's quite interesting. It was discovered in the 18th century by a man called Christopher Pinchback. In its time, it was very popular. But it is called Poor Man's Gold, because it looks like gold, but it isn't gold. It's an alloy of copper and zinc. But in the 18th century, the quality of gold was 18 carat, which a lot of people couldn't afford. So if you wanted to look as though you got a gold brooch and you didn't want to pay for 18 carat, you bought that. So it's over 100 years old. It's a morning brooch. And I bought it for £25, so surely there must be a little profit there. I hope so. And that little spree leaves her with £135. And Chuko with the place to himself. About time he made a purchase, do we think? Oh, hello. This is interesting. This is something that's right up my street because it's architectural salvage, really, and it's got history to it. And this kind of character on his way to an inn is all hand-painted. And just the colours, the yellows, the blues, the reds, you'll never find one of these that will look the same. And it's got that kind of nostalgic element. You know, when you have a smell or a taste and it takes you back somewhere. A bit like Marcel Proust with his famous Madeleine cakes. Pickled eggs might do it for pubs. It looks like this has been stuck on afterwards. It's all metal in there. So I'd say early 20th century, maybe 1940s, maybe 1950s, around there. Love it. Love to have that in a real posh restaurant, contemporary shop, you know, warehouse apartment. Nice pad. Posh Chelsea pad. If I can get that for £50, £40, in with a good chance. Let me see if I can find a price on it. It's not price, which is quite often a good sign. Hey, do you see what you did there? <laughs> Time to talk to Steve. Steve! Oh, I've got this here. Quality. That's nice, that sign, isn't it? All hand-painted, metal, double-sided. I'm talking it up, aren't I? What am I doing? Yeah, never going to get it for what you want. No. Now. How much? I'll take, seeing as it's you, yeah. 40 quid. Yes. <laughs> That's a great deal. 20, 40. Thank you very much. Take care. Cheers now. And that leaves him with 160 for his next shop. So, while Chuko goes in search of knick-knacks new... Margie has headed elsewhere in the city to take a brief break from shopping at the Western Approaches Museum, where, in the company of curator Jack Collis, she's come to find out how war games helped turn the tide against the Nazis. We're currently stood in a 50,000 square foot bunker with a seven foot thick high ceiling and also three foot of reinforced concrete on all sides. It was in this building that groups of German U-boats that were hunting our ships were actively monitored and tracked by the Women's Royal Naval Service. And it's all here. The Western Approaches Tactical Unit, or WATU for short, was established in early 1942 to try to help fight what Churchill called the Battle of the Atlantic. My word, it's massive, isn't it? The operations room would have been a very sombre place during the first years of World War II, as German submarines established a deadly supremacy over the Allies. It's 1941 and things are looking bad for us, aren't they? They were indeed. All of our supplies were being brought over from America and Canada. Now, when France fell, all of their western ports went into German hands. It expanded their reach over the Atlantic and their main effort was to actually try and cut our supply lines and starve Ooh. the country into submission. And so the Western Approaches Tactical Unit was set up by Captain Gilbert Roberts, actually a retired naval officer. He brought back out of retirement mm. just for this. And they effectively used the age-old tactic of wargaming to disseminate and really just explore every single route that we could really walk up. When merchant ships had been attacked by lone submarines during World War I, 
Britain had devised a system of convoys escorted by warships to repel them. But now, thanks to the wolf pack tactics of Admiral Donitz and much improved technology, Germany's U-boats were in the ascendance. Roberts eventually concluded that only one tactic was worth its while, really, and that was called Buttercup, where when the code word Buttercup was given, every escort turned outwards from the convoy, firing illuminations to try and spot any U-boats on the surface. Roberts took this and ran with it, and so he eventually came up with a tactic known as Raspberry, which was one of the first tactics ever produced by Wathu. Raspberry would soon be followed by pineapple, banana, step aside and many more as the largely female unit devised clever tactics. And then they trained naval officers by having them play war games based on the real life situations being faced in the Atlantic. So this is Lauren. She's dressed as one of our wrens here, and she is going to be playing Wathu today. Well, Lauren, can you explain this board game to me? Because I'm a bit confused. Yes, so this is a very small scale model, but it looked pretty much like this. So brown linoleum floor, grid lines drawn across it 10 inches apart. Each square represents one nautical mile. The officers who were taking the course would have been on the other side of the canvas, so they would have a very restricted view of it through one of the peepholes. So basically what they would have been able to see with the naked eye if they were actually on board. Well, Margie, why don't we have a go? Go on then. The board in the center just here represents what you're trying to protect. Good luck, Admiral Margie. So your ships are moving forward at mm. a steady speed. 300 degrees away, we have detected a contact. My mm. advice is head directly towards it and initiate a turn. Right. Now, what you can see there that you don't know about mm -hmm. is that the U-boat has just moved closer to the convoy. You are getting uh, attacked by a wolf pack right now, as they say. But I believe Oren has a bit more information for you. So, two white rockets detected on the starboard wing of the convoy. I'm sorry to say you've already lost one of your charges. Right, I've put Raspberry into action. What does that mean? So the convoy will constantly proceed, and it's all down to the escort to try and keep them safe. So, okay. am I going to sink some U-boats? You are, yeah. So it's been a successful manoeuvre, apart from we've lost a ship. Apart from losing that single ship, it has been successful. I will remind you, though, we still have one U-boat at large. Mm. Hard to imagine how playing games could help to win a war. They'd sit there on the radio actually talking about how they just lost the game, and it was always in their mind. Really? And so when they finally came across a situation that was quite similar to the one they've just played out, they already know what moves to make and what will work and what won't. So although it is incredibly unsophisticated, yeah. it can translate to almost any scenario. Amazing, amazing, isn't it? Amazing story. But while Margie's been hitting the high seas, Chuko's made the much more straightforward voyage to the other side of the Mersey. Not by ferry either, but through the tunnel to Birkenhead. And the splendidly named Room 101. A bit like the one in George Orwell's 1984, but with exactly what the shopper needs instead of what he fears. And here's our plucky every person protagonist now. With £160 in his pocket, Dave's the man to do business with here, by the way. Hmm. That was quick. Yes, the spectacles are being deployed. What I love about shops like this is you can be walking around and then something will spring out at you. And this is one of those moments for me. I mean, that is beautiful. Bezic, which is, you know, maybe not as in fashion as it would have been a few years back. But for me, an item like this, I just don't care. The shapes are so Art Deco. So we're talking like 1930s. And just look at the mint green. Look at these real lovely yellow, lemony yellows and the way that this glaze bleeds into each other. I think it's a great item. A biscuit barrel, no ticket price. And I'm rubbing my hand around it, which is what you do. You know, it's immaculate, there's no chips in there. Oh. Whoops. Ah! Oh, I was in love with this. It's got a nibble out of the side there, and it looks like it's been there a while. Oh, gutted. 
People that want these pieces and collect them really want them in immaculate condition and that's where the money is. A little chip like that can really knock it. What a shame. Never mind. Keep looking. Maybe take a peek outside. I'm pretty sure that the George Orwell version didn't have a nice space like this with all sorts of vintage, shabby chic and reclamation items. Oh, love these radiators. I mean, straight away, every house in London, every big, cool, funky house wants to replace their 1980s radiators with these lovely cast iron Victorian radiators. They don't look much, they look beaten, but people will sandblast these, they refurb them, and they really hold the heat. We've got them at home. And this kind of crumbling patina that you, you've got there, a lot of people keep that. They'll paint them, but they don't mind them. A little bit of history and a little bit of where they've actually come from. No ticket price on those either. Great thing. If I can get those at a good price, I think I'll take them home. Over to the man in charge. No, not Big Brother. Hi, Dave. Hi. I've seen two Victorian radiators there. Cast iron, very nice. What sort of price? There's two. Do me a good deal. We do sell them at £25 each. Could I be cheeky and be £20 for the two? Um, give you a chance, yeah. Give me a chance. Oh! <laughs> I've never put my hand in my pocket so quickly. <laughs> that is a good deal. Thank you very much. Take care. He'll be reunited with his rads at the auction. 140 left for tomorrow. Time to get back together and relax. What a day! <laughs> <laughs> I think they may have overdone it. Nighty night. Next morning finds our experts happy to compare what they already have in the old bag. Are you pleased with the way you purchase it? <laughs> um, <laughs> don't laugh. I really am. How about you? You happy with what you've got? I bought something a bit silly. I bought an arm. You bought an arm? I bought an arm. <laughs> with fingers that move. Good idea. It could always bid for itself at the auction. <laughs> or perhaps for Margie's other buy, the Pinchbeck Morning Ring. There must be a little profit there leaving her with £135 to spend today. While Chuko spent a wee bit less, also on two items. Some Victorian radiators and a pub sign, as you do. It's got that kind of nostalgic element. Meaning he has 140 in his wallet. Next stop, Chester. I don't think I've been to Chester. Oh, it's lovely. It's a beautiful city. Lots of history surrounded by walls and things. Our Cheshire Cats will be all over the county today, starting out in the aforementioned Chester. The county town, with, like Margie says, many medieval buildings, as well as several Tudor-style Victorian timber frame constructions. They call them Black and White Revival. And there she is, having just been deposited. She'll be shopping at the eponymously named Antique shop. Funny that. So let's buy some. Spend all day in this shop. All day. I think she likes it. A lot. Oh, look at that. That's interesting, isn't it? I think that's an olive press. That's probably French, because, you know, so many dealers go over to France now. It's probably early to mid 20th century. So you put your olives in there. <laughs> And then you put the weight on top, and then you spend absolutely ages winding it down until you crush your olives. For use in the home, no ticket price. And then when you get to the bottom, which is better than going to the gym, <laughs> all the oil will trickle out and it'll come out there. And there's the little funnel that it would come out on. It's not a nice French antique. I've never seen one before. Un bon début. Just working my way around this amazingly interesting shop. And then you look at something like this. Look at that. <laughs> Made on a farm probably about 200 years ago. Thrown together, really. You can't call him a master craftsman. He's made <laughs> but it's been made for a purpose, and it's still here. 
It's indestructible. Of course, she seems to have come over all agricultural today. I've no idea, but I think maybe harvesting apples. But isn't that fantastic? It has survived. I'm not going to buy it, <laughs> but I love it just for its antiquity. It's so solid. It's lovely to handle. A real antique. Unfortunately, lovely. No real profit likely, though. Proprietor Peter is happy to hear she likes it, however. That's interesting, isn't it? The sign. Oh, it's like a plaque, isn't it? Yeah, aluminium. Yeah. Dated 1953. The tree was presented by Miss N. M. Birch, which is a bit of a laugh, isn't it? Says you. <laughs> No ticket price. And planted to commemorate the coronation of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on the 2nd of June, 1953. Oh, isn't that nice? Yeah, nearly 70 years old. I like that. I like the way it's sort of got canted corners. Right, I'm going to put that on my think, maybe, list. That's fine. And I'm going to carry on, because I've seen a few more things I like. Crikey. It's going well. What's next? You know, I really like bells. That's like a doorbell, isn't it? Look it over the door, the shop door. And we've got varying sizes here. We've got a little, oh, that's a little one, a little dinky one. She's so musical. Oh, they're all different tones. It's like a symphony, isn't it? I fancy buying a bell. <laughs> it's bell day. <laughs> and there's some more bells here. Good old handbell. Oh, look at that. And it's lovely to see them all clean and nice. That's the emblem of the war department, I think, so this probably would be... A fire warden's bell, yeah? So, is it about to toll for thee? Peter, I've had a jolly good look round, and there's three things that have drawn my attention. Very good. First thing, that interesting plaque about the tree. Yeah. Tell me how much that is. Ten pound. Oh, sold. I like the bell. That can be 25. Sold. And then that little olive press thing. The olive press is great. I really like it. Whether or not anybody's going to want to buy it is another thing. How much can that be? 45. So that's 45, 25 and 10. So that's 80 pounds. 80 pounds, yeah. And I bought three things. You bought three. Go on, do it for 70. Oh, peeps, that's great. Thank you. Oiling the wheels. Making the press 35, the plaque 10, and the bell 25. Bye, Peter, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. 65 left over. Now, before Margie is mistaken for the town crier, huh, let's swiftly move to wherever Chuko finds himself. And before you get any wild ideas, he's actually just a few miles away. At a zoo that cares about conservation as well as caring for animals. CEO James Christen. Wow. What can I say? I know, aren't they just beautiful? That's our group of Rothschild giraffes and Stanley, who's our latest arrival, he came about five weeks ago. So the main thing we do here at Chester is around our breeding programmes. One of the examples is with Eastern Black Rhinos. We manage all the movement and the population breeding of black rhinos around Europe. And a number of years ago, we managed to release five black rhinos back into Rwanda that were coming from zoos in and across Europe. That emphasis on trying to help halt the huge decline in the Earth's wildlife populations, which a recent report estimates to be 69% in the last 50 years, is what motivates many zoos today. What's the main threat to these animals? Poaching is one, but probably one of the biggest ones is where human beings are encroaching into the habitats of these particular species, which then reduces the amount of food that they have to eat yeah. and then reduces the amount of animals that they have. So to be able to have them here in conservation zoos like Chester to breed and help decline the population. So when did the zoo start to focus on conservation? Probably between the 1970s and the 1990s. These giraffes, of which there are now fewer than 2,000 in the wild, were one of the first animals to be installed here. When it was opened by George Motter's head over 90 years ago, conservation wasn't quite so high on the agenda, of course. Although animal welfare was. George wanted to create a zoo without bars, and you can see here vast habitats to allow our animals to be able to roam yeah. uh, freely across the zoo. No bars. We use things like moats and ha-ha to be able to create this really natural feeling yeah. habitat for the animals that are here. One of the other main functions of the best modern zoos is animal research. 
such as with these long-term residents. There have been Asian elephants at Chester since 1941, and it was the first UK zoo to successfully breed them. But as well as the struggle to survive on the Indian subcontinent, the species now has a new threat, a deadly virus. Oh dear. Hiya, I'm Chuko. Hi Chuko, uh, I'm Alan. So how serious is this virus? The Asian elephant is under tremendous pressure from all ways, really. What they don't need is this virus. This virus is, is lethal. Yeah. Elephants around two years of age, quite young elephants, that's the real risk. And it's, it's killing baby elephants all over the world, in zoos and in the wild. The elephant herpes virus, these viruses hybridise and mutate, and we've got a really, really nasty one in this here called EHV1A, and that's killed seven of our babies. And um, it's heartbreaking, you know. Every elephant that died, we learn a little bit more about that. Yeah. And the zoo eventually linked up with the University of Surrey, and we've now in a pilot scheme to vaccinate these elephants and make a vaccine. With science, you need proof. So it's a tremendous amount of hands-on work. You can't do that with, with wild elephants. Yeah. So are you optimistic? Certainly with the, with the way the vaccine trial's going, yes. It could be a really, really big deal. One species which thankfully isn't endangered is the flamingo. In fact, they're robust enough to put up with the ministrations of the zoo's newest recruit. Megan's in charge, though. Whoa, look at these. So we have seven Caribbean flamingos here with wow. us today. How beautiful. I thought they'd be a lot more eager for the food. Oh, well, wait until you sit down. And whatever you do, don't tell any flamingo jokes. <laughs> Quite messy eaters, aren't they? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they bring the water in with all the shrimp and then they push the water out but keep the shrimp in. Very clever. He's quite greedy, this one. Yeah, yeah, he's the boss. <laughs> Is he the boss? So, this may be an obvious question. Why are they pink? So it's actually from what they eat. So, in the wild, they eat a lot of um, shrimp and algae that has a certain pigment in. So, when they digest it, they go pink. Um, but here, we recreate that with the shrimp. Ooh. Hello, fella. Um, um, so how old are they? So in the wild, um, they can go to around 60 years old, uh, but here in the zoo, they can go up to 80 years old. Wow. Can you tell them apart? And do they have names? They do have names. This one, this is Diego, and then we have Chico right Hi. there. Hello, Chico. Cheeky Chico meet Cheeky Chuco. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's also feeding time here, if you're hungry for antiques, close to the Cheshire village of Sandyway, where Margie is just about to reach her last shop of the leg, the Blakemere Emporium. Lots in here, too. Although she does only have £65 left to spend, of course. Oh, open. That's unusual, isn't it? <laughs> Could bode well. Now then, why is that so expensive? Now that is an Edwardian silver-plated entree dish, right? And the value of it is probably £20. So what you do is you take the handle off and it serves as two entree dishes, right? Great. I mean, this is an old dish, but only worth £20. This has got £100 on it. And why it's got £100 on it is because on the other side here, that this has been used on the White Star Line. Founded in Liverpool in 1845. White Star Line owned all these famous cruise ships, many of which met a watery end, i.e. Titanic. So, obviously, this is quite an interesting item. So, hence, it's £100. Very collectible. And if you ever find anything from the Titanic, you're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands. Oh, well, back it goes. What else can she come up with? I've been round here a few times. A nice chair to sit on. <laughs> Very funny, Margie. You had me fooled. <laughs> so yesterday it was ginormous, and today it's miniature. Uh -huh. No purchase of any size just yet, which would be of huge interest to her young rival. Margie, Margie, Margie. She's a sly fox. She's really canny, that lady. I'm not sure I can beat her. And she plays it very cool and calm, but I think she's got a few tricks up her sleeve. Oh, I'm worried. I don't want to be worried, but I'm worried. Crikey. Concerned of North London also has one more shop to go also in Sandyway, at Farrow House. And boasting just the sort of stuff he likes. 
Ah, there he comes. And having kept his powder dry today, he still has 140 left, remember? Looks promising in here as well. He will be pleased. You like? I mean, when you see this, you just want to get straight on that horse's back, back to the fairground in the mid-century where this came from. Look at that. I just, oh, what a great item. I mean, first of all, it's all wood. All of this has been hand-painted. So there's real workmanship and art and craft that's gone into this. Literally, you are painting somebody's dreams. You know, imagine being a young kid and seeing that. Circa 1940, no ticket price, though. It's a great thing and really collectible. I would have this in the front room. It's that cool. I think it's sculptural. Someone's rescued this and it's important that it has been rescued. I really want to buy this. Let me try and find out a price. I think Juco may be about to break into a gallop. Hi, Lee. Hi, Choco. I found something absolutely special around there. What's that? The carnival ride. Yeah, that belongs to me. Cut to the chase, how much? Well, I've got it up at 130. Yeah. I was thinking if we could get to 100. 100. Go on, as yeah. it's you, Choco. He finally splashes out. I'm going to pick you up a little bit later. No problem. All right, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. That leaves him with £40 for maybe one more little purchase. And meanwhile, Margie's taken a shine to something. This is a sweet little... Well, I think it looks like an egg cup, but the dealer here calls it a silver goblet. But what's interesting about it is it's got the Prince of Wales feathers on it, and it's 1969, so I think that's a little commemorative of Prince Charles's investiture. It's £38. If I could get that at a more reasonable price... That would be excellent. Hello, Dylan. Hey, yeah. Marty, you're right. So this little silver item, which you've said, you have said, <laughs> is a silver goblet. I think it's a flipping egg cup. I think you might be right. You might have been hazarding <laughs> a guess. That. So, um, if you could just make that a nice price for me, I'll buy it. Is £20 a nice price? A very nice price. Thank you very much. Well done, Dylan. Thank you very much indeed. You're very welcome. And that last buy leaves Margie with £45. Over to Chuko. What a wonderful, quirky item I found here. Britannol popular soldering kit. Everybody would have one of these, right from the early 20th century to the 70s and 80s, a soldering kit to repair stuff. And everyone would have the skill to be able to do that. And it says here, the kit contains everything for speedy, successful soldering. Alliteration, very difficult. Can cause commentary complications. <laughs> and look inside, look at that, and it's like it's brand new, isn't it? And this has to be from 1930s, 1940s, and everything is there. And even better, you've got the old instructions. Look at those. How great is that? Directions for use. Quirky, unusual, social history. I think I'll do well at auction with it. And so, without further ado... Hello, Kerry. Hello. Look, I've got this here. Where did you get it from? That was from a house clearance. I believe it to be 1930s. Yeah, I concur. Five pounds? Yep. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Very nice. Perfect. Take Thank care. You. Bye bye. You bye now. He must have it in his pocket. 35 left. They now just need to point the Jaguar towards the auction. Are you comfortable? Very comfortable. Are you happy? Very happy. Yeah. <laughs> We're looking the park. Shut eye, please. The big day dawns in Newport. The Romans called it Novus Burgus. That was all a very long time before the auction house got going in 2001. I'm excited, are you? Yes! I mean... You never know, do you? I've got a good feeling, though. Have you? <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to win. Really? Yeah, after you. <laughs> after starting out in Liverpool and then seeing an awful lot of Cheshire, our pair have now headed south towards Newport, the one in Shropshire, and Brettles Auctions, where they'll be selling in the room, on the net and on the phone. Margie handed £155 for her five auction lots. Oh, I love these. So they've both got a royal connection. 
I think she's been very smart to put them together. I mean, there's so many people that will buy royal memorabilia. Chuko has just four lots, acquired for a few pounds more, £165 to be exact. Fairground horse. These do very well. Somebody could really want that. You can imagine that in a kid's bedroom, can't you? I think he's done all right for £100. Margie already has her favourite. But what about the man with the hammer, David Brettle? Last chance for you, forever gone. The olive press, yes, interesting thing. Yes, it'll work. Yes, it's good. Yeah, we'll look forward to that one. With the two radiators, cast iron, quite early ones, actually. Will they sell? Yes. Will they make a fortune? Enough with the radiators, then, because it's almost time for the entry of our two gladiators. Getting ready to rumble. And appropriately enough, Margie's bell is about to get us started. The fact it's clean and it's got that sort of arrow mark might give it a little bit of a... Yeah, a bit of a push. Yeah. Ding dong. 22, 5, 8, 32. 32's bid now, 32. Well 32, 32, here we go, gonna be sold. Last chance for you, all done, finished and gone at 32. <laughs> Gotta be happy, Margie, come on. <laughs> Definitely. It could be a bellwether. I wouldn't knock it. No, I'm not knocking <laughs> Chuko's turn. His very reasonable solder kit. I paid five pounds. Come on. Can't lose. Famous last words of that, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I'm starting at 10, 12, 15, 18, 22. <laughs> oh, lovely. 22 bid, 22. Remy go at 22. Last chance forever at 22. Now, that is a surprise. <laughs> 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 shocked, aren't you? Well, it's certainly all there. Good return, too. Wow. She said through gritted teeth. <laughs> <laughs> now, does anyone feel a pressing need for Margie's next lot? Uh, Quite a nice item. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to see it working. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It was an impulse buy. <laughs> I've got bids all over the place. I'm starting at 25, 28, 32. Is it? 35, at 38, 40. Well done, Margie. <laughs> Last chance for you now. At 40 pounds, sold away at 40. <laughs> Should have done more than that. Box. Someone's going to be getting their olives pressed very cheaply, that's for sure. Just thought it might have squeezed up a bit to Small squeeze. Small three-legged stool. I'm starting at 22 Up to 55, now, 60. Ever so slightly advanced technology now, but not much. Juco's radiators. I think it's an important thing to rescue these things. Yeah, great. They're beautiful right, as well, I think. I'll start me there, £20 for those. Very quiet in the world. Are they coming home with us? Start me at 10. Oh, go on. <laughs> oh, 8, 10. Come on. <laughs> uh, 12. We've got 12 now. A £12 being £12, here we go, going to be sold. 15 if you like. £12, here we go, going to be sold this time. Short, finished and done. For 12. Ten, Not seven. the end of the world. <laughs> Next to have oh, a big light. Uh, sorry. Light I've got... His first loss, but not by much. I've heard of that. <laughs> 22 hammers up, last chance. 20 pounds at 20 least, surely. <laughs> Margie's crown jewels. Well, not exactly, but two royal-related items. They don't really match, but... I think they go well together, don't they? they? Do. You're really so... smart, Margie. <laughs> I've got to watch you. We're going to start at 22, 5, 8, 32, 5, 8, 42, 5, don't 8, like. 48, 50 bid, 5... Yes. 55, come in again. <laughs> Told you. At 55, the hammer's up, 60 bid. Five. Stop now, David. <laughs> <laughs> All done and dusted. It's gone at 65. Margie shoots and scores in the crowd. <laughs> As well they might. A terrific result. That's all right. Yeah. Down, the really good. From football to the racing, can Chuko's horse justify his high price? This could go horribly wrong, couldn't it? I really believe in that. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. What a lovely thing. I can start at 100. You're in. At 100 bid, 100 got, 100 pound bid, 100 pound tens anywhere. Come on. Come on. 10. That's better. 120, 130, 140. Come what? on. At 140 pound, Remy, go at 140. Last chance for you. Anybody else going? Quickly round at one hundred and forty pounds. I'm heartbroken at that. You're not. I am a bit. Giddy up, Chuko. No need for a steward's inquiry. 
No. You've got £40. Yeah, I didn't lose. You didn't. Now for the brooch that Margie bought almost by chance. Could be its money, I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? Hopefully I think four. Oh, wow. I'm an optimist. I'm cheap. Got bid uh, from Canada of 12, and I'm now going 15, 18, 22, 5. 25 bid, 25, here we go, 25. No, no, no. More that. 25 bid, all done, finished and gone at 25. Flip. That's all right, you didn't lose. I really like that. Never mind, you win some. You break even on some, mustn't grumble. Most of all the things I've bought. Really? I like that. Yeah. Yeah. It was very pretty, wasn't it? Was. Chuko's pub sign. He likes it. Will anyone else? I'm not sure forty pounds is a good number. <laughs> no, you're probably right. <laughs> you're probably right. I'm praying you're wrong. One thing is, you can repaint it. It's dissonant. It's anyway, dissonant. there we are. Start it is, me. It? Twenty pounds for it. Oh, twenty-two. It's a start. 22 bid, Remy go now, 22. 5. 25 bid now, 25. Come 25 on. bid, 25. 8 anywhere. I've got 25 bid, 25. 25, Remy go, all done. Anybody else? Last chance for you now, anybody else? <laughs> 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 Moving it at £25. <laughs> and oh. Don't want to hear it, Mark. <laughs> oh dear. Oh well, it's been a tight contest with just one lot to go. That being Margie's anatomical model. Can it hand her victory? <laughs> I hope it goes for an arm and a leg. Do you get it? <laughs> 20 pounds oh. with starting. You're in. 20 pounds bid, 20 pounds, 20 pounds got, 20 pounds, 22, 25, 28, a 28 bid, 30, 30 pounds got, two. You're getting close, Margie. 32 bid now, 32, 35, 38, 38 bid now, 38, 40 if you like it. Hammers up quickly, last chance of asking, I am selling, forever gone, at 38 pounds. I think I've got away with it. <laughs> no comment. Is, uh, <laughs> Margie's arm came within a fingertip or two of making her a profit. But who's the winner today? Come on, let's, let's move on. Here we go. Let's do another day. Quite. And the good news is that they leave Newport with their heads held high. Well, almost. Chuko began with £200 and after auction costs made a tiny loss. So, he now has £198 and 18p. While Margie, who also started out with 200 made also after costs a little profit. So, she wins and takes the lead with £209 exactly. I've triumphed. I know, well done, Margie. <laughs> this is the beginning, though, isn't it? I'm going to get you back. I want to make £9. Of course pounds. you'll get me back. <laughs> Yes, I think there will be many twists and turns to come. Next time, our pair are clowning around. Even and all. Getting theatrical. She was the finest woman that ever walked into this town. Elvis Presley. You know, uh-huh, uh -huh. And there's antics at the auction. Oh, gee. Oh, 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 that worked.